does it matter what we believe? Does it matter by what standard we assess our lives and conduct our lives if we do so by any standard at all? Does it really matter? Well, many would ultimately say no to these questions. We're all headed to the same place, just by different roads. You'll even hear this type of thing said by those who acknowledge the existence of God, by those who acknowledge the, even the existence of sin and the need of God's forgiveness of sins. But a lot of the implications would suggest then that truth then is not the exclusive avenue to God's forgiveness of one's sins. And we'll most certainly see this morning that this is false. Consider first of all that forgiveness of sins can only come from God. Forgiveness is roughly equivalent to a number of other terms we find being used in the New Testament, key terms of the gospel. And among those terms you might find such expressions as justification, salvation, reconciliation, being born again. All of these things are redemption. All of these things are closely related to one another. And who has the ability to perform these functions? When we're talking about sins, we're talking about a transgression against God. Now we're told in 1 John 3 and verse 4 that whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now it's certainly possible that somebody can transgress a personal law, a code that exists within a group, a code that exists between two people, a code that exists in a society, but we are focusing this morning especially upon God's law and sins committed against God. Who has the ability then to deal with such matters? We talk about justification. We're talking about a judicial act, a pronouncing of one as being justified, not as standing guilty, even though we're told all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Who would presume to pronounce somebody justified, acquitted, righteous, who has violated God's law other than God? Who would presume to do such a thing? We think about salvation. We're told that sin, again, is something that all have been guilty of, Romans 3.23, and as such, they come short of the glory of God. In Isaiah 59 and verse 1, we're told, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. There is a mighty gulf that exists between sinful man and a holy God. We sometimes talk about the long arm of the law. That is, the law is going to get you wherever you are. Don't think you're going to hide from the long arm of the law. Now, some have successfully done that. But God has omniscience. God has omnipotence. God is omnipresent. He is all of those things. And so he has the capacity to span that mighty gulf between sinful man and himself, that holy God. Now, we'll do so through means, as we'll discuss. But it's God who has that ability and that power. And reconciliation, the reconciling of two at enmity between themselves. You think about the Mideast peace talks that have gone on at various times. How there have been those who have tried to broker a peace resolution in the Middle East between Palestine and Israel. And how well has that gone? Well, who can stand between man and God and broker a peace resolution? Well, it's not something that a human being is capable of doing and to forgive sins. Who am I to say you are forgiven of a sin that you have committed against God? Who is a priest with his collar on backwards to say, I pronounce you forgiven of what you have done before God? Now, I can forgive somebody for sins that they have committed against me personally, but can I forgive a sin that somebody committed against Brother J.D.? Do I have that ability? 
Suppose somebody has been spreading malicious, false rumors against Brother J.D. And that offender comes to me and says, says, Lee, I beg your forgiveness. Well, I suppose I could forgive him if there was any sense in which he had offended me or committed sins against me in these acts, but it's really not my place to forgive him. Would it not be presumptuous of me to say, you're absolutely forgiven. Don't you worry about it if you'd never tried to make things right with Brother J.D. How much less can I or any other human being presume to forgive a sin committed against the Almighty God? But we have a society and a religious world that presumes to do just that. In Proverbs 30 and verse 12, we're told that is, there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. They think they're clean. They think they're washed. They think they're pure before God, but they've never done what God has commanded to be washed from their, cleansed from their filthiness. Human beings have a need for God. We all need God. We are created in the image of God, and it's without God we're grasping after wind. And the book of Ecclesiastes makes this very clear. And we see a lot of people out there who are grasping, it seems, after God, but they're grasping after wind. I'd like to read you from an article that it actually came out several years ago. That was in the March 13, 2004, Dallas Morning News. And uh, in this article, it says a woman by the name of Renee Shepley Reagan gave up on following a single religion and now embraces, quote, Christian, Hindu, Unitarian, and more. She calls her path interfaith spirituality and, identifi and, and identification she shares with a small but <clears throat> emerging group of Americans. They customize their spirituality by picking and choosing practices from the world's religions, often without any particular attachment to doctrine. This uh, woman goes on and says, a lot of people are finding that one religion doesn't have all the answers for them. Shepley Reagan said, we help people discover their spirituality but we don't tell them what it should look like. The article goes on and says, they downplay the differences among religions to focus on common threads such as love and mercy. It's inconsequential to them, for example, that Christians teach that Jesus was the Messiah, Muslims say that he was a prophet, and Jews say he was neither. People accuse us of practicing smorgasbord spirituality, said the <coughs> Reverend Susanna Stefanacci McComb, an interfaith minister in New York who has embraced the contemplative mystical practices of Catholicism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Sufism at different points. They mean it to be derogatory. That is this comment, sp smorgasbord spirituality. They mean it to be derogatory, but there is truth to that. We're seeking the essence of religion, which is spirituality, not dogmas. That is where you feel God. The article then goes on and says, many practitioners say they became disillusioned with their childhood faith and spent years bouncing from religion to religion, searching for a better fit. Then it's like a light bulb goes on and you realize you don't need to choose. Ms. Shepley Reagan said, there's no contradiction because the goal of all religions is basically the same, only the paths are different. Only the paths are different. And so really it doesn't matter which path you choose, these ladies are saying. This paper is saying that a lot of people have embraced this type of thinking. As long as your goal is right, that is all that matters. And so you hear people talk about the necessity of sincerity, of the search, but it doesn't matter if you arrive. 
who would dare presume to fill this void that only God can fill? And God fills it in the way that he sees fit. And so you see people that are grasping after God, but really what is it that people need from God? They need fellowship with God, absolutely. They look forward to an eternity with God. But prior to having these things, it is essential that we have the forgiveness of sins, and that forgiveness can only come from God. Behold, thou art of pure eyes that behold iniquity and canst not look on sin. Habakkuk 1.13. That is our holy creator. He has the ability to reconcile us. None of us can do that ourselves. In Hebrews 7 and verse 25, we're told, with regard to Jesus Christ, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God by him. Folks, I of myself cannot do that. No human being of him or herself can do this. Our Lord is the one who can do this. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. Let us consider then that anything other than truth comes from a source other than God. Anything other than truth comes from a source other than God. We're told in Proverbs 19, 21, there are many devices in a man's heart. Now notice, in a single man, there are many devices, many plans, many purposes, many different ideas, and they can conflict. They can tell a person to go all sorts of different ways. Well, let's put us all together. And how many different devices are there in all of our collective hearts and all of our collective minds? Well, there are a lot. And so there are a lot of ideas that people have come up with with how to find God and how perhaps even to be saved. But as has been discussed throughout this lectureship, truth is by its very nature singular. Anything that contradicts it is of necessity false. We're told in Hebrews 6.18, it is impossible for God to lie. That is one thing that he cannot do. Yes, he is omnipotent, but he cannot contradict his own nature, and his nature is truth. That is something that he cannot violate. And so we look at our landscape today, and we see all these different paths, all these conflicting roads, but really... If we look in the right direction and we appreciate the facts, we can see that there are not infinite roads. There are essentially two. There are two roads. There are those who can kind of color that road a diff little differently. Maybe somebody might put on little different glasses on your face and make you see that road a little differently. But ultimately, you are looking at two roads. There is the Lord's road, the way of truth. And there is Satan's road, the way of the lie. In Isaiah 55, 2, the question is asked, Wherefore do ye send, spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Again, striving after wind. We engage ourselves in all types of pursuits that it might even have spiritual motives. But if we're not following the truth, we're not following God. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There are many devices in a man's heart, many of them. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Proverbs 19, 21. And that is the only counsel that will stand ultimately. All others will fall like a house of cards. Anything other than truth comes from a source other than God. Consider also that God has given saving truth. John 1, 16 and 17 says, Of his grace have all we received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Many people look at grace and truth 
as mutually exclusive. But no, the two come together in one. We have saving truth in God. Many people today have a big hang-up with doctrine, and we saw that from those quotes we looked at from those ladies in that discussion, interfaith spirituality, that smorgasbord spirituality, that people don't want dogmas, they don't want doctrine, so people have a hang-up with doctrine. And so it does not only apply to the unchurched. We see people who downplay the idea of doctrine because they want to attract the unchurched and we're told the unchurched, again, we talk about words that we never heard a few decades ago and this is one of those words out there now, the unchurched and those, so that's who we're supposed to be really directing our efforts toward. But it doesn't only apply to the unchurched that people who have a hang up with doctrine. You see the so self-appointed church growth experts that tell us we all need to drop doctrine, we need to drop dogma so that we can grow. But that's generally speaking the fact that people have a hang up with doctrine. People don't like to be told what it is that they have to do. They don't want to be told that there is a mutually exclusive path that you need to travel, that you need to be on that. As Paul told Timothy to preach the word, he said, For the time will come, 2 Timothy 4.3, when they will not endure sound doctrine. The time will come. Paul was speaking in the future tense, but folks, we don't need to speak in the future tense, do we? We see that all around us. The time has come that they do not endure sound doctrine. But Paul said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Hinduism. Baha'i faith. All this type of spirituality, new ageism the emerging church movement, all these things that are going on today. But even denominationalism, that's not the saving truth. That's not the gospel. That's not what God has given. Those are contradictory and man-given ways. So, again, we think about the fact that we're dealing with a present reality. They do not endure sound doctrine anymore. They have turned their ears away from the truth. They are turned unto fables. Folks, what is taking place right here, right now? Here is this lectureship where truth is being put forth in a metropolitan area where there are millions, millions of people. Why is this place not filled right now? I don't know how many people are watching on the Internet right now, but there ought to be thousands who have watched this, even millions who have watched this on the Internet because the truth is being presented. Is that what is taking place? No, it's not. So what is to be our response in the light of this fact that they have turned their ears from the truth and they're turned into fables? Well, Paul told Timothy what he was to do, but watch thou in all things... Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And so what do we do? Change everything. Find one of these other paths that are more popular or combine a number of paths so we can get the most people. Is that what we need to do? No. We do like Paul said. We endure. We persevere. We don't give in. We do the work of an evangelist, literally a preacher of the gospel. That, my friends, is doctrine. That is the truth, and that is necessi of necessity. And so there is this gospel that is spoken of. And gospel, of course, means good news. And good news is that this is that which saves. That's why Paul wasn't ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. We think about the different terms for, again, that are equated with salvation or closely linked to it, and being born again is one of them. Being born again is one of them. Of his own will, of God's own will, begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 
We're told in James 1 and verse 18. That word of truth is what gives us life again. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23 speak about that as well. The gospel, the word of the gospel, the everlasting gospel, which will not be destroyed. That's by what we're going to be saved. And so it is good news. It tells us that we can be saved. It tells us how to be saved. It tells us such things as we read in John 3, 6, 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Everybody can be freed from their sins. Everybody can be forgiven of his or her sins. Again, the prerogative does not belong to me to forgive anybody, but God has taken that step. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, that everyone could be forgiven. And so there is good news. All can be saved. The world can be saved. Now, does this good news have hard parts? Well, sure it does. Jesus said that if no one could come after him except somebody denies himself and takes up his cross daily and follows him, follows him wherever it goes, that way of the cross, we need to follow it wherever it goes. Jesus would go on to say, whoever finds his life, he's going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, that's that one who's going to find his life. And so we're willing to give up whatever is necessary. Jesus said, so likewise, whosoever it be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 33. Again, we've heard that verse a couple of times during this lectureship. Buy the truth and sell it not. And so to have this saving truth requires a high price on our part. But it's worth it. When we know what we're going to receive in exchange, it is more than worth it that we pay that cost. But most people are not willing to do this. We need to appreciate it then for what it is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 and following, we find Paul speaking about this saving truth. Verse 18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So it's the preaching of the cross that is it involves hardship. It involves the sacrifice of Christ, something that a lot of people don't like to hear about, but it involves sacrifice on our part as well. And so it's foolishness to some, but nonetheless it is the power of God. We read as well later on in this same chapter, verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and of the Greeks' foolishness. Wait, it's not what they want to hear, but you preach it anyway? Absolutely we do. Why? But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. This is where true wisdom is to be found. This is where the power of God unto salvation is to be found. And anything else is error. If people have a hang-up with doctrine. Their hang-up is with that very thing which saves. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. This doctrine is true doctrine. But take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. 1 Timothy 4.16 And so by paying close attention to this doctrine, this is how people are going to be saved. So people want to say it's inconsequential whether someone says Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, whether somebody says he is just a prophet, or whether somebody says it doesn't matter what they think about him at all, he's neither. But is it inconsequential to God? Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please God. Jesus said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. You are going to be lost. What someone says about Jesus of Nazareth is crucial to God. It's not inconsequential. It's crucial to God. And it's crucial to one's ability to receive forgiveness of sins. John 1 verses 10 and following says, Jesus was in the world. 
And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Through belief in the truth of his identity, through the belief in the truth of the gospel, one has a right to become a son or daughter, we might say, of God. That's a right that then needs to be exercised. And that's the truth that came upon the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes, there were ages and times past where Jesus Christ had not been revealed. But now he has been revealed. And this is the gospel that we have until Jesus Christ comes again in judgment. Folks, we do not need a new gospel for a new age. We need the old paths. That's what we need. We don't need to find out new ways. We need to be content to go back to the old paths. I love to tell the story. I love to hear the story. I love to follow the story. Why? Because it, is, because it is the power of God unto salvation. And the same truth that saves the saint also condemns the unredeemed. Again, redemption is one of those terms. And who could pay the price for our pardon, for our redemption? except God who is willing to give His only begotten Son. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, we're told, For we all, all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. In Acts 17, 31, we're told, God has appointed a day in the which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained. He's going to judge the world in righteousness. What's that mean? He'll judge the world in righteousness. Well, his judgment will not be arbitrary. It means he will not condemn anyone to eternal destruction on a whim. Given two people who have followed the exact same way, lived the exact way, done the exact same things, he will not justify one and condemn the other. As we find being said in Genesis 18, 25, that be far from thee, Lord to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The judge of all the earth will do right. The Lord will judge according to a standard, and that standard is the truth. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things Romans 2 and verse 2. Sinners have violated, violated that standard. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. That is, God's law. 1 John 3 and verse 4. And so we need to follow that truth. We need to conform to that truth. And any way other than God's way of truth leads to destruction. That's why Jesus spoke about these two ways. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, he did not need to speak about infinite number of ways. He said, enter ye in at the straight gate, this confined gate, this tight gate, this more difficult gate. He said, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go there at. It might take on the appearance of numerous ways, easy ways, appealing ways, but ultimately it's going to destruction. But Jesus said you need to enter in at that other gate, that narrow gate. Follow that narrow way because it leads to life even though there be few that find it. It is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to those who trouble Christians. But to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels... In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 through 9. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against those who suppress, who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Romans 1, and verse 18. Back some decades ago, there was a man and his wife who were traveling and visiting in Colorado, near uh, Estes Park, Colorado, and there was some flooding taking place. 
And this man was an engineer, and he was able to look, and he said, something's wrong here. He said, we need to get out of here. And so he said, he told the, the ones who owned the inn where they were staying, he said, you need to get your wife, get your children, and get up to higher ground. And he said to his wife, he said, I'm going over to the other side. I'm going to warn our friends over on the other side that they need to get up to higher ground before it's too late. And so he ran off, went to the other side, but nobody paid attention to what he had to say. His wife, he left behind, she got up to higher ground. But it wasn't very long before she got up there, before that dam burst. And the floodwaters rose, and over 100 people died in that flood known as the Big Thompson Flood. So there was this message that was true. There was about to be a destructive flood coming their way, but only his wife paid attention to that message. Friend, there is a message likewise for you. We're told in Hebrews 7 and verse 25, that Jesus Christ is able to save them to the uttermost who come unto God by him. That's the only place salvation is going to be found. God has given saving truth, and it is in Christ. It is in, in his body of the saved. We're told in Ephesians 5.23 that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the body. And Ephesians 1.22 and 23 tells us that that body is the church. And so we're told in his saving truth where that salvation is to be found. Are you there? Are you continuing to abide in the truth? He that abideth in the doctrine. He has both the Father and the Son. But if you do not abide in the doctrine, if you do not abide in the truth, you have neither. Friend, not all people are heading to the same place regardless of the road that they travel. Even sincere, moral, religious people are not all headed for the same place. And so if you've never obeyed the gospel, we would plead with you to be conformed to that precious word of salvation. In Romans 6 and verse 17, we're told that for those who had been the servants of sin, that God was to be thanked that that was the case in time past. You were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Doctrine, truth, you have obeyed it. Earlier in that chapter, it says what they did to obey that form of doctrine. Again, the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we obey, we're told in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Know you not that so many of us who were baptized in Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There it is. Death burial, and resurrection. You obey from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Do you need to do that this, e this morning in faith and repentance? Or perhaps you're a child of God who's strayed away from the truth. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, if you wander from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Friend, you need to come back to the truth. If we can assist you with any of these things, come together we stand and together sing the song of invitation.